I'm not going to give Shannon much of a bio here because you should know who she is. She is one of the members of the Legislative Assembly for Lethbridge West. She has been politically active in Lethbridge for, man, it's more than a decade. It doesn't seem that long, does it? Or does it seem much longer? I guess it depends on the day. Shannon I b ran in 2012 the first time, ran in 2015, ran in 2019, ran in 2023. And if you live in her riding, you are awfully proud to have her representing you because she's done it with dignity, diplomacy, and grace. And that's not something you can say about every politician in Alberta today. <laughs> Okay, okay, enough of that, enough of that, enough of that. Let's, let's get to the brass tacks here. She is speaking about building strong communities and, and a strong economy for Alberta. Um, that's a rock you're pushing up a hill right now, but we can all hope for better days. Uh, I'm really interested about this topic when I heard about it because I think when you talk about a strong community and a growing community, uh, Lethbridge, is the place and and Shannon is the person to talk to because in in four years as the ruling government of Alberta I work at a, re, a locally owned retail store in Lethbridge and we saw people come into our store at a higher rate than we ever had and it continues to be strong here in Lethbridge there continues to be a strong locally local business supporting base and I think we're recovering a sense of community after things like global pandemics. So, Shannon Phillips, MLA for Lethbridge West, a big round of applause. It's a real handshake, Dylan. <laughs> Didn't bring my wet fish with me. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, here this afternoon. It is a pleasure always to uh, speak to the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs. Uh, thank you to Dylan uh, for that uh, very kind introduction. Thanks to him and uh, Rob Miyashiro for running security uh, uh, here today. And I will add that my mom is here. Uh, for added backup. Uh, so the, that was a very business-like, very workman-like introduction that Dylan gave us. I will just add that the no-nonsense approach uh, I, that is also will also be undertaken by one Barb Phillips. She is not just a raging granny, she's also private security detail for me. <laughs> um, I, of course, I'm, we're gathered here on uh, Blackfoot territory, and I share, I acknowledge the Métis people who share a deep connection to this land. For 55 years, the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs has been a gathering place for discussion and debate in a forum fostering community, citizenship, lifelong learning. I'm going to talk a little bit about the value of SACPA and the I inspiration that I uh, uh, draw from it a little later on uh, in my remarks today. Um, for me, since day one of moving to this community, I, I want to say it was 16, 17 years ago, it was a while ago now, SACPA has been part of that connective tissue uh, that makes Southern Alberta so strong. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly those, the words of uh, Gordon Campbell at the back on those banners that uh, well-informed citizens are the lifeblood of a liberal democracy, uh, I, I take those words seriously and, uh, and I know that you all do too and that's why uh, uh, it's, it's so important to make these connections to you once a year, as I have tried to do uh, over the almost eight years uh, in public life here in Lethbridge, because I take the view that Albertans like you have always been the fire in the furnace uh, of our province. And I'm excited to speak with, uh, with you today about our, uh, our values and our priorities going into a very important uh, election campaign. So in just a few months, 109 days in fact, Alberta uh, will have one of the most important choices it has ever made uh, uh, in front of it. We will be determining the future of our province and the choice could not be more clear. The choices could not be more stark. There are, is a choice between two leaders and two very different set, sets of priorities. Rachel Notley and the Alberta NDP are focused on making sure you have a family doctor, a physician that's free to see without user fees. Rachel Notley's vision is ensuring that our hospitals are places of care, not chaos. 
Her vision is to bring you real relief from skyrocketing utility bills and the skyrocketing cost of living. Now, Danielle Smith has told us she's been very clear about her plans. She has said that she wants us to get used to the idea of paying to see a family doctor. Danielle Smith and the UCP will continue to cut the hospital care you and your loved ones rely on, and they will bet our future on more reckless, extreme ideas. Our full platform will be released, re released in the coming weeks in anticipation of that to review 109 days until Election Day. But today I want to tell you more about uh, some of the ways we'll work to make life better here in Lethbridge, in southern Alberta and beyond. Rachel Notley's vision for Lethbridge, shared by Rob Miyashiro, our candidate in uh, Lethbridge East and me, is to defend public health care, lower the cost of living, build on our industrial might to create a more diversified, resilient economy, and build a resilient, healthy city where our downtown is vibrant, our communities are safe, people have appropriate housing, and our children have access to the education and services they need to thrive. Let's start with health care. Um, let's start with the basic health advice, which is to drink more water. Um, can someone pass me? <laughs> Let's start with our hospitals. We have all seen the pressure and the strain. Now, certainly the pandemic caused some of it, and certainly the instability that we have seen since uh, uh, we've been able to uh, stabilize much, much of our response to the pandemic has caused some of it. But bad choices of the UCP government caused a lot of the chaos and instability we see now. In the middle of a pandemic, the UCP chose to attack frontline healthcare workers by proposing drastic cuts to uh, salaries for registered nurses and other frontline health workers, by entirely tearing up our agreement, our master agreement with uh, physicians. They tore up that contract with doctors, and what do we have now? Albertans are waiting longer, whether it's for a hospital bed, for an ambulance, or for a new doctor to replace the one that up and left us. Our hospitals are overcrowded and understaffed. That includes Chinook Regional Hospital, where people are working as hard as they can to maintain the levels of care that we know that we need to have to keep our community healthy and safe. But it is straining each and every person who works in that hospital system or in our primary care system. Just four weeks ago, our intensive care unit was full. And we, we were looking at having to move patients up to Calgary due to staffing shortages. In the last week or two alone, I've, uh, I've been canvassing a lot in Calgary and in uh, Lethbridge. I hear a lot from families who are telling me they don't have the services we need. My heart broke the other day when I talked to a parent who advised me that the uh, child and adolescent mental health program for uh, high-risk children here at Chinook Regional is no longer. Our psychiatrists aren't there. We don't have the psychiatrists right now. So your choices are general population psychiatry unit, psychiatric unit, which is no place for a child, or Calgary. Those are the choices right now. Just put yourself in the position of that parent uh, with, with, uh, with a high-risk child. We have an acute shortage of obstetricians. I had a terrifying conversation the other day uh, with a person on their doorstep in that field of labor and delivery. She said to me, we don't have enough OBGYNs. The ones that we do have are on locum, and that is good. They are trying as hard as they can, but they are so short-staffed, she said, we're missing things. A mom or a baby is going to get hurt or worse. That's what our frontline healthcare workers, that's the kind of moral distress we are putting people into right now. We have a serious shortage of family doctors. I do not need to tell anyone in this room that's a good bet that about a third of you have uh, uh, lost your doctor over the last uh, uh, little while, or you at least know people who have. The problem here is that Danielle Smith has the wrong priorities. They are focused on privatizing health care, and they have said openly, she has said just a short time ago, that Albertans should, quote, get used to paying for health care, including paying to see a family doctor. Let me say that again, paying to see a family doctor. Those are not the solutions we need at this time or at any time. New Democrats believe our health care system is one of our greatest achievements as Canadians if we want it to be. If we have a government who is focused on you 
and on the business of uh, uh, getting on with a, a healthy and prosperous economy and a healthy and prosperous Alberta, who are focused on the right priorities, not on themselves, not on their own internal drama, we can rebuild our health care system. In the coming weeks, you will see us present a plan for family medicine that will mean more Albertans have the chance to see a family doctor and the full range of primary care services that they require. And uh, that will include an historic ex expansion of care delivered in communities, which will have real benefits for families. We will also fix EMS, lower response times for Albertans going to hospital in an, in an ambulance, not the back of a minivan, and putting more qualified paramedics and EMTs on the road. We will make sure that our loved ones in long-term care age safely and with dignity, and we will undertake the biggest healthcare recruitment campaign ever seen in the province's history. No more layoffs, no more threats, no more privatization. Alberta's NDP in a Rachel Notley government will be the defenders of hospitals and free, accessible health care and the legacy of Medicare in this country that the province wants and deserves. That is our commitment to Albertans. Now, we all know that families are bearing the brunt of the inflationary crisis. Right across the country, families are seeing the price tags on common essential goods and services rising faster than at any point in the last 40 years. Meat, fruit, bread, everything. Uh, the price of everything has gone up. We've all seen it at the grocery store. I have often, I observed uh, recently in the, in the legislature that the uh, price of groceries has gone bananas. Thankfully, bananas have not gone uh, up as much as things like oranges and eggs. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that people's basic essentials have uh, gotten increasingly difficult uh, uh, to meet. Albertans have had to make do with finding new way, uh, ways to stretch their paychecks further and further. In the last four years under the UCP, wage growth is among the slowest in Canada. Uh, we have been raising the issue of inflation for three years, and the UCP has refused to take action. Now, there are many things that government cannot control. Supply chain disruptions, uh, uh, the, the latest banana crop, we don't grow them here. There's no question that government cannot do everything. We import a lot of things. There's a lot, uh, there are big wheels turning in the global economy. But uh, where the provincial government has exclusive or most jurisdiction, that is to say, in car insurance, in utility costs, in school fees, property taxes, with uh, uh, how much they fund municipalities, with uh, uh, your seniors' drug plan, with your seniors' benefits, all of those things, every single step of the way on every single one of those things that I enumerated and more, their decisions have raised the costs that are affecting families. Key programs like the seniors benefit lost ground to inflation because they de-indexed it after we uh, had, had indexed it during our time in government. This is resulting in too many Albertans having to choose between groceries and rent or their mortgage. We have got to see real relief on the cost of living, and in a Rachel Notley government, we will. We will increase those benefits for seniors to offset the cost of inflation, and we will not stop there. In the coming months, you will see a major commitment from us to lower the costs that are hitting families the hardest. We will implement a full-on car insurance premium freeze pending a review and start work on a longer-term plan to lower rates uh, from, for Albertans. I think we need to make the commitment to Alberta drivers and their uh, monthly bills more than the UCP commitment to insurance lobbyists when they took the cap off uh, our, our car insurance rates, one of the first things they did in response to uh, extremely profitable corporations that came in and shook them down in the summer of 2019. Seniors will no longer have to pay for their driver medicals and we will lower the cost of drugs by restoring the seniors' drug plan. Instead of endless tuition hikes and cuts to post-secondary institutions, including the college and the university right here in Lethbridge, we will support our next generation of leaders by investing in post-secondary education in all of our communities. We will create new childcare spaces at $10 per day. We will cut school fees by giving school boards the tools and the funding they need to run a decent public education system and focus on what really matters when it comes to our schools, smaller classrooms, teachers, educational assistants who are uh, uh, well remunerated and well supported, and a modern curriculum that sets our kids up for the future. Mm -hmm. 
I feel strongly about it too. I really would like my children to uh, graduate literate and numerate when they're done with the K-12 system. Really? <laughs> Finally, we will uh, undertake real supports for the most vulnerable. I know we have all seen the rise in poverty and homelessness right here outside of this room. Where's the, there it is, that's uh, in that side. Where all summer long, uh, we could see people who were unhoused in our city. That population has doubled since 2019. Instead of kicking the can down the road with yet another task force, I think we all know that we have problems to solve here in Lethbridge from our uh, uh, income and other supports uh, uh, funds and programs all the way through to how we fund our housing authorities, how we uh, ensure that we build accessible, affordable social housing, how we even private with, uh, partner with the private sector on getting some of this done. We know we have problems to solve here in Lethbridge, so when the UCP comes and announces another task force, which I imagine they probably will, thank you, it's time to get to work, actually, and not focus on your own internal drama. <laughs> I live here, I see it, and I hear you. And this is, there's, there are issues related to public safety here. There are issues related to economic resilience for our downtown. So we need to work with our community organizations to rebuild the kind of city that we know we can and should live in. Cuts to housing budget, social services, and general neglect of the job of a provincial government for four years got us here, and it will take a change of government to get us out. To that end, next week I will be hosting a number of meetings and roundtables to ensure we have a specific set of proposals for the City of Lethbridge that are costed, substantive, realistic, pragmatic. It won't be solved overnight, but we must get to work on addressing the housing crisis in this city. Our vision for Alberta centers around a real plan for the economy as well, and those two things go together. We can't have a vibrant downtown if uh, we have the kind of, of uh, homelessness and uh, uh, people going without the basic primary health care services that we know that they need, uh, I, I, being un sleeping unhoused, unsheltered in our downtown. We need a broad plan, much beyond that, but including that, to make sure Alberta's economy is prepared for the future. Albertans know our economy is changing. It always has, and it always will. So we need to be diversified, resilient, and ready to compete on the world stage. We know this very well here in Lethbridge with our greatly diversified economy. We are in the midst of a skills shortage, and many international employers are telling us they don't have the workers they need with the skills that they need. So now is not the time to cut post-secondary education. Alberta's finances, our fiscal balance sheet, is seeing some recovery from the rising price of oil. There's no question about that. But Alberta families are not feeling the benefits in the same way that they did in previous oil price booms. Wage growth, as I indicated, is slower than in the rest of Canada. We have fewer business starts than most major provinces, and we have the highest unemployment rate outside the Maritimes, and Calgary has the highest unemployment of any major city in Canada. Globally, we are seeing investments follow jurisdictions that lead on things like clean technology, good health care, investment in post-secondary education. Above all, investors are looking for certainty, predictability in an era of rising interest rates and supply chain disruptions, and global geopolitical risk. Yet here, the UCP has not taken those countervailing factors and said that their response is going to be stability and predictability. No. Instead, their response to all of these factors that we cannot control is to create more chaos and more instability. By, for example, passing the Harmful Sovereignty Act that chases investment away, instead of listening to Albertans who said very clearly, the business community on through to ordinary uh, uh, folks said very clearly, this is not the priority right now but they uh, uh, bulldozed ahead. Top priorities for Daniel Smith and the UCP are taking away your Canada pension plan, taking all of that money and using it for her own political projects. She even indicated that she would take that extra money somehow, this is not how it works, uh, to pay for an Alberta police service and firing the RCMP out of the province. That is not the type of stability and predictability that investors are looking for if they're going to make large multi-billion dollar investments in our region or in our province. Daniel Smith cheered on the supply chain disruptions last year with the Coots border closures, costing our economy down here in Lethbridge millions of dollars a day. 
None of this creates a stronger economy. None of it creates jobs. Now, we have built a real plan for the future of our province when we have built by listening to Albertans. For the past four years, we have been consulting. We have consulted with over 100,000 Al Al Albertans in various uh, uh, town halls and other capacities. One of the blessings of the pandemic, one of the silver linings, uh, 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 if there was one, that we, was that we could conduct so many of these uh, uh, consultations, one-on-one -on -one meetings, roundtables with various industry groups, experts, uh, e economists, and others from ar uh, around the country. We have been then, therefore, releasing proposals on albertasfuture.ca. We have detailed proposals there on our investment and, and uh, competitiveness strategy, on our digital media strategy, on our uh, agriculture and agri-food value-added strategies, on hydrogen, on geothermal, you name it, it's up there. Uh, it has been an amazing opportunity to really listen to the full gamut of Albertans, from CEOs to retirees, on what their economic priorities are and where the real challenges and opportunities lie for our great province. So we've got uh, some plans up there to, for example, take all of our Alberta energy expertise and use it to add more valuable value to our non-renewable oil and gas products, while also expanding our footprint in renewable energy generation and storage. Under our competitiveness and jobs strategy released uh, in December by uh, our leader Rachel Notley at the Calgary Chamber of Commerce, we will create good industrial jobs in petrochemicals. We will establish Canada's first hydrogen fuel hub right here in Alberta. We will continue to be, to be leaders in energy in every sense of that word. We have a plan to boost the technology sector, creating jobs in our artificial intelligence, innovation, research and development. We will champion agri-food and ag tech, making sure producers are given new opportunities to add value and meet the global demand for food. We have the capacity right here in southern Alberta with our irrigation system, our research and entrepreneurial capacity, our proximity to U.S. markets to be a major economic hub for the province. We should do it. We will have the workers we need to address the skilled labour shortage because our party won't cut from Lethbridge College and the University of Lethbridge. We will fund it for the centres of excellence that they are. We will create jobs building the schools, primary health facilities and uh, ensuring that our hospital infrastructure is there when we need it and we'll do it on time and on budget. No more delays, no more broken promises. We'll support the arts, music, film, and television industries that are growing at an exponential pace right now. And uh, while Danielle Smith and the UCP have not ruled out mining our Rocky Mountains, we will instead protect the water that sustains our livelihoods, agriculture, and our economic future. Under an NDP government, there will be no metallurgical coal mining in the eastern slopes. Yeah. Through all of this, uh, uh, we have made the commitment uh, to specific fiscal anchors within our approach to budgeting. As finance critic, I have been very clear about this, and that is why Rachel and I sought the advice from former ATB Financial Chief Economist Todd Hirsch to help us for, uh, with a plan for the surplus that we are seeing last year, this year, and likely next year as well, at the very least. We have asked Todd to give us uh, very pragmatic advice for a balanced approach using these windfall revenues, we must treat them as windfalls, to use our fiscal capacity to build more fiscal capacity, whether that's in paying down debt, saving for the future, or finding creative ways to have that asset that is coming out of the ground now turned into assets for the future by investing in our future. I want to make one final point, and it's an important one. Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs was founded by Gordon Campbell, uh, and uh, Gordon and Sylvia Campbell were deeply committed to liberal democracy. That's why everyone from Shannon Phillips to Danielle Smith has taken this podium over the last 55 years. And so, in Gordon and Sylvia's honour, I want to make the following announcement for new schools in Lethbridge. If elected, Rachel Notley and Alberta's NDP will ensure that a new Catholic elementary school is built on the west side. This is the top ask from the Holy Spirit Board. We have listened carefully, and it is time to make this commitment to the people of Lethbridge. Our west side is growing. Schools are way 
beyond capacity and they should not have to wait any longer. There is more. Of course, the public board has, has something to say about this, right? <laughs> Galbraith Elementary on the north side is 108 years old. It is the top priority for the public school board, given its age and its role as an anchor for one of our uh, uh, inner communities on the core of the west or the north side. It is a diverse school that serves diverse needs. We need our north side neighborhoods to thrive, for often they are forgotten. Good schools mean good property values, commercial investment, good parks, access to transit, all of it. As the MLA for the city, I am deeply committed to our role in making sure all neighborhoods get what they need. We will modernize Galbraith School. 108 years is long enough to wait. <laughs> And finally, as I dug into the uh, school capital plans, uh, we need some planning for school infrastructure. The three school boards operating here in Lethbridge have 11 more priorities for modernization, a potential at least two more new school asks between now and 2035, which doesn't, which sounds like a long time, but the problem here, people, is it takes two or three years to build a school at least, and children have a bad habit of getting older. And so when you build an elementary school, eventually you're going to need uh, an expansion to your high school. We have extraordinary enrollment growth, or at least we have in the last few years. The pandemic has introduced some instability in that, so we need to make sure that we are a real partner, just as we were in our first term in government when we built or modernized 244 schools across the province. We need to make sure that school boards have the support they need in rapidly growing cities like Lethbridge. This, my friends, is what happens when you elect a government that is focused on you, not on their own internal drama. Broadly speaking, friends, our vision for Alberta is one that is ready for the future. Albertans are tired of the recklessness and chaos of Daniel Smith and the UCP. Their plan is gambling with your retirement and making you pay out of pocket for health care. Rachel Notley and her Alberta NDP team will bring back a stable, competent and caring government. We'll end the chaos in health care, we'll make life more affordable, we'll build a more resilient economy. Rachel is the leader to get that done. She has the experience and she has assembled a team of capable and talented Albertans from all walks of life who are ready to make it happen. Albertans are honest, hopeful and hardworking. You deserve a government that's every bit the same. We can move forward with hope and optimism, a vision for our future that's more prosperous, where we dream bigger, act bolder and Alberta for all. Thank you. Look, I moderate a lot of these sessions. No one brings it in at 30 minutes. No one. That was 30 minutes. That's a professional speaker right there. Boy, I'll tell you, that was nice. Holy mackerel. What a wonderfully centrist viewpoint that will be painted as left wing by tomorrow. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, uh, there's a, a fellow here, a handsome young fellow right here. That's where we're going to line up for questions. If you've got questions, we're going to bring you up as soon as you can. So if you've got them, come on up now. We'd love to fill Donahue this and just walk around the crowd with a, with a microphone, but we can't. Oh, and I have a written question. Look at that. And beautiful penmanship. So everybody's going to get up to this microphone. They're going to state their name. They're not going to talk about their voting history or who the, or their life story. They're just going to state their name and then they're going to ask their question because the question's what counts. So let's let's do that for the first time ever when I'm here. <laughs> once once you've asked your question, you can go sit down unless you have another question. If you have a second question, just scurry your way to the back of the line because the next person gets to ask their single question. <laughs> And man, I'll tell you, I really hope that actually happens because we came in at 30 minutes. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. Are you ready, Shannon? So we'll get Shannon up here. And our first question is ready to go. The microphone, you don't have to get too close to it. Okay. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, my name's Ian Hurdle. I think it's ironic as a... Uh, I lost my family doctor, and so did my wife, and that's ironic because we're both retired physicians. <laughs> um, 
Our problem really started even before COVID. Uh, the cuts in payments to family doctors, you saw the all the evening and afternoon clinics and weekend clinics disappear. Um, what I want to talk about available is uh, family physicians. So I have a daughter who is a very conscientious family physician. I talked to her five weeks before her elective C-section, before she started her maternity leave, and I sort of naively said, how much paperwork have you got to do, a, a month or something? She said, no, five months, and that's unpaid. So what we've seen in the last few years as family doctors, we typically want 35%, 40% of medical students eight or nine years in to apply for it. Um, this year, it was 23% in Alberta. Uh, if your magic wand and the NDP elected, what can you do? Yes, I, I thank you for that. There is no question that um, when the doctor's agreement, the master agreement was torn up in the fall of 2019, which was before uh, uh, the pandemic, and just as we were going into the pandemic, we were uh, beginning to have meetings with family physicians and other specialists here in town saying, this is going to happen. You, we are, uh, people are going to leave practice. They're going to retire early. They're going to leave the province and so on. And, and exactly that happened. Master agreements with physicians are legislated for a reason, uh, uh, so that there is stability and predictability for uh, uh, family physicians to be able to invest uh, uh, their time in a, in a, com in a community, uh, to enter into uh, arrangements with other uh, uh, physicians in order to uh, open clinics and so on, to hire staff to ensure that uh, we have the full range of primary care options available um, to people. So the first, first and foremost is uh, we will make sure that we have a legislated agreement that is not negotiated by yelling at anyone on their driveway. It is negotiated uh, uh, like adults in a room who negotiate uh, a labor relations agreement. So there's that piece of it. Um, and then that is then uh, uh, legislated. Um, and uh, we know that there are some inconsistencies and so on in the uh, master agreement that has now uh, replaced the one that the UCP tore, not, tore up. So uh, we might have a little bit of work to do on that. We do have to invest in primary care more generally because as you point out, we don't have any walk-in capacity here in Lethbridge anymore. So if this cut on my thumb actually does get more infected, um, I have to go to the emergency room, as bananas as that is. Um, that is not a good use of anyone's time or resources. But that is what we are left with. Either that or I stop in Okotoks at a, at a walk-in clinic on my way home from Calgary. That was my other thought that I could probably do. Uh, so that's where we're at here in uh, at Lethbridge. And so there's, there's some capital investments that need to be made there. There's some uh, smoothing out of the uh, physician master agreement. And then there is recruitment. You are right. It takes a long time to make a doctor or a nurse. Uh, so what we need to make sure we are doing is we have the right labor relations environment so that people will at least stay. And they will not uh, go off to, to either greener pastures or burn out or take uh, uh, short-term leaves and the sort of thing that we are now seeing uh, across the healthcare system. So that is a partial answer uh, uh, to your question. I think at the end of the day, you know, there's all kinds of tricky policy questions to answer. But uh, when it is um, accompanied by basic values, which is respect for public health care, the system itself, the people who work in it, and the people who need to access it, that can go a long way. Hi, Ken Sears. Uh, first, I had a question that was handed to me, so I've just done that. Um, Shannon. This is the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs. It's not just Lethbridge. People in all these little towns around Southern Alberta, some of them are, you know, tuning into Shaw to, to see what you're, what you're having to say. What do you have to say to people in places like Raymond, people like Pinch, places like Pincher Creek, places like Tabor, where their economies, their downtowns are dying, their populations are falling, and they have been taken for granted for generations by the governments in power. What do you have to say to them to give them some hope? Uh, 
Uh, thank you. That's an excellent question. I think the, the first thing is, of course, uh, um, around the economy. This is one of the reasons why we have taken seriously, and we do have up on albertasfuture.ca, a, a quite well-developed proposal around agriculture, uh, value-added uh, uh, agri-food processing, um, and uh, a number of different either uh, uh, fiscal and tax arrangements, uh, uh, programmatic arrangements, and so on, uh, to make sure that uh, we are attracting all of the investment that we can, because uh, those kinds of uh, in, uh, investments, and they are very, very large, often like Cavendish Foods and, and uh, others, uh, really are anchors uh, uh, of employment for communities. But once people get there, uh, they need to have access to health care. And uh, I just saw today that Milk River uh, uh, emergency room is uh, closed once again for a, a, a short period of time. Pincher Creek uh, has seen a number of disruptions of, of service, particularly uh, for OBGYNs and uh, uh, women who need to uh, deliver babies uh, out there. Uh, and uh, we have seen service disruptions across the province, indeed, uh, not just in southern Alberta, uh, particularly in emergency rooms, but uh, oftentimes for other services through their hospitals as well. So we do need to rebuild that piece. I was talking to our absolutely fabulous candidate in uh, Livingston McLeod the other day, one Kevin Van Tegum, and uh, of course, uh, outlawing coal, coal mining in the eastern slopes is top of mind for many of his constituents, given the uh, uh, reliance on water uh, for the agricultural sector and uh, given the really unequivocal stance taken by uh, city councils in places like High River uh, and uh, Okotoks and elsewhere. But it's so much more than that. They, uh, at Nanton needs a new uh, middle and high school modernization. They need uh, some modernizations to their assisted living facility there too. Uh, and we need to make sure that again we have that the provincial government is doing its part. You know. Uh, the final piece I will say there around regional economic development is the, uh, is to highlight the extraordinary work of South Grow. Uh, who are our Regional Economic Development Authority. And uh, uh, they suffered uh, needless and absolutely unexplicable, unnecessary cuts uh, I, over the course of this government. They've had some of that restored, and that's a good thing, and I commend the government for doing that. Um, we have lost a lot of investment attraction and local uh, ability to make the business case uh, at to potential investors through those uh, losing those funds. Uh, and uh, we should certainly be making commitments to our regional economic development authorities uh, uh, in a multi-year way so that they can enter into many of those conversations with really, really uh, uh, large investors uh, to make sure that the, we've got the business conditions right to make sure that we are creating those jobs. I'll, I'll go quick to one of my written questions. Uh, okay, so this is, a question, this is a question from Penny Elford, and she's talking about the use of ambulances in patient transfers from, from rural communities into, into, into appointments within the cities. Um, I, I know that they, they do ambulance transfers between cities and things like that. They also do them from rural communities into the city. Um, the question is, does the NDP plan to look at how ambulance service is, and this is Penny's word, not mine, misused, and maybe consider like a non-ambulatory or a, a less expensive transportation to get people to non-life-threatening appointments? Well, uh, I, certainly um, there is no question that uh, when we call an ambulance, it should be there uh, uh, for us and so that we, we have to make sure that we are using resources I in the most intelligent way possible. And uh, down here in Lethbridge, that and for many of the, the southern Alberta uh, rural communities that uh, Ken was just talking about, that was through local dispatch, which uh, was consolidated into AHS, uh, much uh, against the wishes of the city, um, the, uh, uh, the local uh, paramedic firefighters uh, and others. So um, we need to restore some, uh, some, some sanity and some logic uh, to the way that uh, our EMS system is governed. We need to make sure we have enough uh, uh, paramedics and, uh, and others with the right level of skills, uh, uh, not just the physical ambulances, but there also need to be people driving them. Um, and as for rural transportation, uh, certainly AHS has some capacity uh, to do that for non-life threatening. And uh, when we were in government, uh, there was also just 
an expansion of, of rural transportation writ large. We had uh, a connector uh, at bus that went from Medicine Hat to Lethbridge. The vast majority of the usage uh, of that stopped in a bunch of the rural communities uh, uh, along the way on that Highway 3 uh, uh, corridor. Um, and uh, uh, that was funded as a rural bus pilot. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously during the pandemic, uh, it was um, sort of paused by the UCP, but then they canceled it. I think as we exit, now we need to start looking at some of those rural transportation uh, options for people. Um, there was a, a, a very good provider here. It was a, a run with a Red Arrow out of the, the city downtown transit um, uh, uh, hub here. And it was working quite well, particularly for seniors. And I know a lot of my constituents were using it and it's unfortunate that it has not returned. Good afternoon, Shannon. Thank you for coming. I really enjoyed that. Sounds very exciting. Uh, my name is Violet Meekma, and my question has to do with the Crow's Nest Pass, which you touched on briefly. And uh, we spend a lot of time out there in the summer and have grown to love the place and the people. And I think those mining families are really suffering with the downturn of the coal economy, of course, uh, and the phasing out of those mines, and will continue to do so. I'm wondering if you have any plans specifically geared to that community, and if there's any thought of maybe developing tourism further, um, enhancing the trail systems and the parks and the camping. So, yeah. Thank you, Shannon. Well, uh, as it happens, I think it was on, oh, it was on a day, Monday or Tuesday, I met with the CEO of Travel Alberta, who was talking to me about exactly that, about uh, how they are, uh, so Travel Alberta is a Chris or Crown agency, and uh, they uh, ensure that they have good lines of communication open with uh, all elected uh, officials, and they were talking about the regional hubs of uh, uh, tourism development that they have undertaken, uh, and one of them, they see a real bright spot uh, in that Crow's Nest Pass, Pincher Creek, Castle, uh, extension of Waterton all the way up the foothills. Um, and we also know that Albertans, especially during the pandemic, used that area uh, a great deal when no one could go anywhere else. People all of a sudden discovered uh, the beauty that uh, we all uh, know, many of us anyway, know that has been there for a long time, uh, all the way up the, the Highway 22 corridor, the foothills and so on, and uh, into the pass. Um, and so uh, all this is to say that uh, there is, the, the government was supposed to be releasing a tourism strategy that I think it's fair ball that it got kind of pulled back because of uh, the pandemic and the uh, sort of a lot of the unknowns in terms of, of how you develop a tourism strategy when nobody can go anywhere. Um, and, uh, I, and, and now they are moving forward with that. Uh, that corner of Southwest Alberta is a priority. We will continue that. Uh, and there's a few other things that we can do around tourism uh, development, around use of the tourism levy around uh, uh, funding um, of uh, the actual infrastructure as you point out whether it's on public crown land or on parks land uh, uh, infrastructure then allows us to have thoughtful and sustainable uh, uh, tourism whether uh, and if you have you know the bridges the pathways the the bathrooms the picnic tables uh, uh, that you that you need to to make sure that people have that high quality visitor experience um, we invested 250 million dollars into our park system uh, and uh, uh, more into uh, public land infrastructure uh, when we were in government through the capital plan um, and it barely scratched the surface uh, because there was such an infrastructure deficit there uh, there is no question that uh, uh, some of those thoughtful investments mean that we can all uh, get outside in a way that is affordable for all of us. I think everyone deserves uh, that high quality outdoor experience, but also that we so that we can um, welcome tourism and uh, frankly their dollars and their investment uh, from all over the world uh, uh, in a way that is sustainable for generations. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laurie Schultz. Shannon, thank you very much for your presentation today. Uh, my question is in regards to the long-term care. Um, would the NDP implement the federal guidelines that were just released for long-term care? And if so, would you be able to elaborate on how you would proceed and the timelines? Uh, and I realize that's a general question at this point, but thank you. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know if we've had a, a chance to really dig into the a actual specificity and um, um, 
consequences of the federal long-term care uh, guidelines quite yet. I think we'll probably have more to say about that as our critic uh, uh, for uh, uh, seniors and, and housing, um, uh, Laurie Sigurdsson, has a, a chance to really uh, uh, review them in greater detail. Um, there is no question that uh, investment in public long-term care uh, is something for, that for a very long time was uh, uh, neglected, which is why we created 3,000 uh, new long-term care spaces while we were in government. And again, uh, you know, which sounds quite ambitious, but it barely scratched the surface in the context of an aging population with more diverse needs. In particular, I'm thinking here of uh, uh, the types of resources that are needed for uh, dementia and Alzheimer's care. Um, and so uh, these are uh, areas where you need sustained investment uh, and then you need to listen very very carefully to uh, frontline workers uh, uh, residents and their families about what uh, about staffing ratios uh, health care needs uh, and so on we uh, uh, have uh, dug a bit of a hole uh, here in Alberta and we will have to catch up both on the capital side and on uh, uh, in terms of our uh, relationship with the frontline healthcare workers delivering uh, these services. That comes out of negotiated labour agreements, again, uh, that um, is not something that we yell at people on their driveways about, it's something we just get down to work and do. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, just some of the, the hard work of, of being in government and tough choices depending on, on fiscal situation and so on. Having said that, I know Lethbridge Housing Authority, you know, it's, it's also all the stuff that happens before you end up in long-term care, right? So Lethbridge Housing Authority, for example, has identified a number of needs for more accessible, affordable housing for seniors uh, to age in place uh, outside of the care system. And I think those are uh, recommendations that the province needs to take seriously as part of an overall housing investment. Uh, and uh, there is no question that the home care uh, system as well is significantly stressed. And uh, again, that goes to the, the broader health care uh, recruitment strategy that we need to take seriously as a province. I'll go quickly to another written question. Um, I don't have a name for this one, but what it boils down to is other provinces to fill in, uh, to do, have a stopgap solution to sort of skill, to bring in skilled workers. They offer them incentives like long-term care workers being offered, uh, you know, salary bonuses should they move to Alberta to work. Uh, anything in the plan for that? Uh, uh, Rachel Notley will be uh, uh, providing a bit more um, color to the uh, already, uh, uh, we've made an, 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 a commitment to a very large healthcare recruitment uh, uh, strategy for the, the province. There's no question that a lot of the problems that we see right now are due to understaffing uh, more than anything. And uh, those are problems, I think in fairness, that we need to acknowledge persist across the country and indeed across the industrialized world due to aging population, the stresses of the pandemic and so on. The point here for a provincial government with uh, jurisdiction over health care delivery is to not make the problem worse. Uh, and, and we have absolutely no assurances of that happening if we do not change uh, uh, who is in the Premier's chair and around the cabinet table and in government. And uh, uh, so, um, those kinds of approaches, yes, I think would be under consideration, but again, uh, you want to negotiate these things. You want to do this in consultation. You don't want to just kind of rush out and go, oh, the, the other folks are doing this, so we're going to do this. Uh, uh, we need to make sure that it works for the, uh, the state of the workforce right now, for the kinds of training opportunities that we have in place right now. Uh, and uh, uh, frankly, also in negotiations with the federal uh, government around the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program uh, and uh, immigration more, more generally and skilled uh, uh, immigration and recognition of foreign credentials and so on. So again, what, a lot of what this comes down to is you can't have a government that every eight months goes into absolute uh, dark mode uh, because there's another leadership uh, uh, crisis where the palace intrigue ensures that no one in government has their eye on what is actually important to people because that is what has happened over the last almost four years. I've been watching them and they, they just, they go into outer paralysis because because there's yet, you know, uh, I, I, another um, um, leadership crisis. And uh, that is what results in a lot of this backlog of problems to solve because governing in a province as complex as Alberta is hard. So, so you have to get up in the morning and go to work every day, not focus on your own internal drama. Leona Jacobs. Um, so 
I got a mail out from a political blogger that I follow who talked about a $20 billion gift to the oil and gas industry. I have no context for that and I was wondering if it had in a separate article in today's paper we talked about the R store the, and I wondered if they were related and regardless I'd like to know what the plan is for the abandoned oil and gas wells. Yeah, um, so for context for folks, uh, uh, there are some elements of people uh, that had, uh, back when Daniel Smith was a lobbyist, hired her, uh, that wanted uh, royalty credits for cleaning up their um, their wells that are being dis decommissioned. Of course, as a condition of approval from the Alberta uh, Energy Regulator, you must clean up your mess when you're done. That is, that's why you get the permit to uh, drill and extract the people's resources uh, uh, in the first place. So a royalty credit to do something that you are legally obligated to do and have already agreed to do is a massive giveaway. There is no question that there are ways that we need to ensure that we are thoughtful about the resilience and the long-term um, um, uh, both uh, uh, jobs and uh, 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 productivity of the oil and gas sector as things change, whether that's in uh, value-added oil and gas or in uh, uh, decarbonization and electrification of primary processing. Alberta can and should uh, 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 keep up and remain competitive in the oil and gas space. This is not that. This is simply a pet project of Danielle Smith uh, uh, to give large gifts to people who do not need them. And so it, it, is, um, it, it, is, it is a scheme that has been actively resisted by the PCs before us, uh, by us. This is non-ideological, really, unless your ideology is falling off a cliff somewhere over there on the right. Um, and, and so that is uh, what's being proposed. We'll see what they do with it in the budget. Uh, it is a monumentally bad idea. The good news is we have 109 days. <laughs> Uh, we'll go to another written question. I don't have a name for this one, but the question is, um, aside from not giving billions to oil, company, oil and gas companies, um, where's the money come from for a lot of this? Oh, um, so uh, in terms of Alberta's fiscal picture, uh, when we're talking about uh, diversification, what we're talking about there is ensuring that we have uh, the full gamut of, uh, uh, of investments from very, very large facilities like uh, agricultural food processing, like petrochemical diversification, uh, uh, like ensuring that we have uh, uh, Canada's first hydrogen hub, for example, uh, uh, here in Alberta, uh, with I ensuring that we have, uh, we are welcoming investment and we have a stable, predictable investment climate for renewables in, in all of their uh, uh, gradations, including uh, renewable storage. Um, there is no question that uh, a vibrant private sector and, and uh, a new private sector investment is a key part of both our diversification problems, but also how we pay the bills around here. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, there's nothing uh, uh, anathema to, to point that out, that we need to have an, a jobs competitiveness and investment framework that works uh, to build Alberta's future. Having said that, we can be a lot more thoughtful with uh, 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 how we uh, invest those corporate income tax revenues, those royalty revenues, and our personal income tax revenues, the three biggest buckets uh, uh, of, um, uh, of Alberta's fiscal picture. And when natural resource revenues are predicted to be as high as they are for last fiscal year, this one, and likely next year, we need to have a plan for the surplus. We all remember the bumper sticker, God give me another boom, and I promise to you I won't piss it away this time. <laughs> Danielle Smith promised, or not, uh, the Kenny government promised to make additional deposits in the Heritage Fund this year with some of those windfall revenues. Danielle Smith comes into uh, uh, power, she promptly reverses that promise. My friends, this is how you piss away a boom. So we need to make sure that we have the right balance of paying off debt, which in some uh, conditions can be a very uh, smart thing to do, and it needs to be counterbalanced uh, in terms of return on investment against savings in the Heritage Fund and the type of returns that come out of the Heritage Fund. What do we save for in the Heritage Fund? We save th th those revenues. They come out of uh, Heritage Fund every year. It's usually a couple billion goes towards general revenue which pays for health care and education and so on. That could be so much more 
into the future managed wisely. And it should be uh, our goal to save more. Uh, uh, counterbalanced, of course, against uh, uh, the, the, uh, the debt to GDP ratio and all those other balances. Um, and then the final picture there is how we invest in Albertans. Because attracting investment isn't anymore. It is 2023, it's not 1993. We attract investment through the whole picture of the type of people, the access to water, the access to health care so that companies don't have to enter into private arrangements with insurance companies. There's all kinds of reasons why um, when people look around the globe, they choose places like Lethbridge. And a large part of it is skilled workforce, infrastructure, and health care. So that is the brief of a provincial government, not to running around uh, uh, chasing um, uh, things that are not a priority, weird conspiracy theories, and so on. The, the brief of a provincial government is those things. They are complicated enough. We have enough work to do without uh, I I introducing all kinds of uh, I I other complications. So that is where we will focus to make sure that we have, the, uh, we stabilize our revenue picture so that we can pay for the services we need within the context of a fiscal plan that has the right anchors associated with it and there is some discipline associated with it. And, and this will be our last question as we are right up against it. And it's going to be an easy one because it's Bev. <laughs> Two questions. Bev Mundell Atherstone. It's Bev's prerogative. Yeah, killing me, Bev. First, first one, very simple. Um, this, the present government took away a lot of the funding that came from the province to the municipalities. What would the NDP do? And the second question is related to health care, because I have my other hat on, chair of Friends of Medicare locally. Um, it's been said that nurse practitioners who do many of the same uh, things as our uh, primary care doctors um, do, could, could come in and they could create their own clinics and they could do a lot of these things, uh, diagnosis, um, prescribing medications and so on. And to take away some of the uh, busy work from the doctors, we could have medical recorders. Your comments. Yeah. The latter is about primary care reform, and there is no question we need to do it. And uh, uh, one of those, uh, that team-based care uh, uh, can be helped along by, by, by government in, in terms of uh, uh, citing it appropriately, like the, the, the physical infrastructure for it, um, and then looking at various models, whether they uh, are in this province, and there are some, or uh, what is now uh, moving along in jurisdictions like British Columbia and Ontario uh, in terms of alternative uh, remuneration plans in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes those work, sometimes those are the right uh, uh, answer. I'm not going to say they are uh, everything. But um, again, when you, you, I, I think we need a commitment, first of all, to some of that uh, primary care infrastructure, uh, and then uh, making sure that we have uh, the right direction from government, um, whether it's through the Ministry of Health or through AHS, uh, to, to populate those in a team-based care, uh, whether it's nurse practitioners, dietitians, social workers, uh, uh, counseling psychologists, those models models work uh, when it is not just a, a family physician on site uh, because you know life's complicated the world's gotten more complicated and people's uh, uh, health concerns have, co uh, have gotten more complicated along with it. Uh, the first question was about municipalities. municipalities. Uh, yes uh, so we um, uh, we did a city charter agreement with the big cities uh, UCP tore it up and that was uh, uh, basically like stabilized uh, uh, funding and ensured that the big cities, you know, when the provincial fortunes went up, their fortunes went up and provincial fortunes went down, the same thing happened. Um, we did not finish our agreement with smaller cities and uh, uh, um, smaller centers at that time. Uh, we will be doing both, I think, uh, is, the, uh, uh, is the response there. Um, because that, that stability and predictability, not just like yanking back and forth or will we or won't we on MSI and all the various other little funding uh, uh, envelopes, that is not helpful um, to be able to um, 
um, for municipalities to be able to plan. And I think that's one of the reasons, those cuts are the reason why uh, all of us are looking, all of us who pay taxes here in, in Lethbridge anyway, are looking at a 5% uh, a year increase after several years of zeros. Uh, you know, I for one, after four years, a 20% property tax increase, that's, that's gonna be noticed. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the province certainly has a, a role to play there with their, they are one of the, they are, if not the biggest funder of uh, cities like ours and municipalities uh, across the province. And so we need some stability and predictability there because um, uh, that is just another way that people are getting hit. Um, and uh, uh, there's really no need for it when on the other hand, you have a minimum $13 billion surplus uh, uh, sloshing around. Uh, the uh, the provincial coffers right now a minimum and absolutely no plan no visibility other than just sort of one off uh, here there and everywhere um, uh, on how that is going to be used those those windfall revenues uh, to to stabilize our our collective fortunes uh, for into the future. Thank you, Thank you Shannon. Uh, round of applause for Shannon who answered all our questions. A reminder, next week, same time, same place, we've got the fiscal outlook for 2023 and a recap of years past by Cardston Siksika MLA Joe Scow. He will be here speaking. It'll be good. Come eat, buy memberships, donate, enjoy yourselves. And remember, SACPAW stands for Civilized Debate, Intelligent Debate, Fact-Based Debate. Just keep that up all week, and we'll join you back here next week. Thank you.